Some of you might have heard about the dark night sky paradox, also known as Olber's paradox. It states that in the infinite universe with the infinite number of stars, the whole sky has to be filled with the bright light. In every point of the sky there has to be a star. Even though they are farther and dimmer, there are more stars at greater distances. There is also the heat death paradox, which states that the universe had to achieve thermodynamic equilibrium a long time ago and it shouldn't have any stars by now. You could call them light and dark sky paradoxes. There is one more paradox that involves the sky, the red sky paradox. Unlike the first two, which are quite old and basically have been resolved, this one is quite recent and not well known. The paper about it came out last year. So what's it about? Well, in short, why isn't our sky red? Well, to be more precise, why don't we have a red dwarf in our sky? Yeah, that probably doesn't make it any more clear, so we'll have to dive in. Let's talk about red dwarfs, life in the galaxy, how common it could be, and a lot more. My name is Andre, and this is Cosmos Elementary. How likely is life to occur on a planet? And what about intelligent life? Are we alone in the universe? Perhaps it is one of the biggest questions we still don't have an answer to, but we keep trying hard. Apparently, a lot of things had to happen and be just right for life to occur and continue existing for billions of years on Earth. But obviously one of the main factors is the type of the star which a planet revolves around. Earth is orbiting the Sun, a G2V spectral class star. It's also called a yellow dwarf, which is actually a bit confusing, but I'll get back to that. I've heard multiple times people saying something like, Earth is orbiting an ordinary star. But is our Sun really that ordinary? Well, obviously there is a lot of stars similar to our Sun, but it's not the most common type. Most of the stars in our galaxy are low-mass red dwarfs of 0.08 and up to half solar masses. They make 75-80% to 80 of all stars in our galaxy, also they live much longer. They stay on the main sequence for tens of billions, perhaps hundreds of billions of years, or even more. So sun-like stars are just a few percent of the whole stellar population, and they have way shorter lifespans. So we could say that our star is rare. Also, recently a lot of rocky planets that orbit red dwarfs have been discovered. Some of them are even in so-called habitable zones. So, if there is a lot more red dwarfs and they live longer and they also have rocky planets, why don't we have a red dwarf instead of a yellow dwarf in the sky? The first one seems way more likely. So that's the paradox in a nutshell and the obvious solution seems to be just a blind chance. Sure, there is a lot more red dwarfs and let's say we would be like 100 times less likely to occur in a system with a yellow dwarf. But even way less likely things still happen occasionally, so it happened to us as well? I'm getting anthropic flashbacks. Can it be just a random chance? Sure. But this answer doesn't seem very enlightening. Sure, we can blame it on the accident, but this doesn't really help us gain any new knowledge about the universe. So what if we are not just lucky to be a product of a happy unlikely accident? But are there actually some processes in the universe that make it more likely for life to appear on a planet orbiting a sun-like star? That is something to think about, instead of just blaming it on simple chance. The paper I've mentioned offers four different solutions. Chance is one of them, so three to go. But before we talk about other solutions, there are a couple more things concerning red dwarfs I'd like to touch on. There is one more red sky paradox for you. We know that most of the stars in the Milky Way are red dwarfs. But what about our solar neighborhood? So this is a great image from space.com which shows our closest stars. We can see the same trend here. Most of the stars are M-type stars or red dwarfs. So the galaxy consists mostly of red dwarfs. Our galactic neighborhood is full of red dwarfs. Then how many red dwarfs can we see with the naked eye in the night sky? None. Nil. Zero. So what's up with that? But actually the solution is very simple. Red dwarfs are small, low mass and cold stars. And they are also, you guessed it, very faint. Even the closest star to the Sun, Proxima Centauri, which is a red dwarf, is not visible with the naked eye. 
Proxima Centauri is probably a part of a triple system together with uh, Alpha Centauri AB, but Proxima is relatively far from those two stars. So if our Sun had such a companion at a distance of Proxima Centauri from Alpha Centauri binary, we would probably see it at night with the naked eye, but some of the stars would be brighter than the Sun's companion star. That's how dim they are. So even in the best conditions, on a very dark sky and with a calm atmosphere, we see just a fraction of even the closest stars. Most of the stars are too dim for our eyes to see them. It's also interesting why low-mass stars are way more abundant, but that's a topic for another time. For now, I'll just say that current star formation models predict and observations show that low-mass stars form more frequently and at the same time they live way longer than more massive stars. So while more massive stars are born and die, red dwarfs remain. A new population of stars appears, massive stars die, and again more red dwarfs remain and so on. Actually not a single red dwarf had enough time since the Big Bang to die naturally by simply running out of hydrogen in a core. And not, let's say, by colliding with other stars. The universe is just not old enough. So even the oldest red dwarfs are not even in their middle age. Another question comes directly from the name of the paradox. Would the sky actually be red if we orbited a red dwarf? Well, first the color of the sky and the color of the star are different things. Despite of our sun being called a yellow dwarf and even the fact that from Earth it sometimes looks yellowish. In space, without the effects of the atmosphere to our eyes, it looks white. Some people can get confused by images like these, which are actual images of the sun, but it's simple. They are just taken with various filters at different wavelengths. Usually when we speak about the color, we mean visible light. The light our eyes can't see. So could red dwarfs in a similar way be actually not red? The color of main sequence stars depend on their surface temperature. The massive hot stars are blue, cooler stars are white, and even cooler are yellow and then orange. Each spectral class has subclasses, and our sun is yellow very, very slightly. But stars do have different colors, and sometimes we can see it with our own eyes. And it's even more distinct through the telescope or on photographs. I found this website which helps to get at least some idea about the actual colors of stars, what they would look like if we were close to them. The colors you are seeing now may not be the same because of different screens, but again, we can have at least some idea. So what about red dwarfs? Here is Proxima Centauri, Bernard Star, Wolf 359, all of them are orange. So here are some stars in order and we don't see any truly bright red colors that you could see on some illustrations of red dwarfs. So yeah, M dwarfs are definitely redder than, let's say, G-class stars, but they are not as red as in pictures like this one. And speaking of the color of the sky, the atmosphere plays a huge role here. Our sky during a sunny day is blue, but it can be red during sunrise or sunset. So it's better to talk not about a planet at a red dwarf, but about a specific planet with certain conditions. Then we can have at least some idea of what it could look like. A year or so ago, NASA published a video where they simulated skies and sunsets on various astronomical bodies. It had one red dwarf, famous TRAPPIST-1 star, and it shows what a sky of TRAPPIST-1e planet might look like. Let's enjoy a sunset on a planet that orbits a red dwarf. So what about the solutions to the paradox? We've already covered one, but it's not the best one. We need to keep in mind that the first solution had to assume the same likelihood of life occurring on a planet orbiting both red dwarf and a yellow dwarf. But in reality it is probably not the case, so it leads us to the next solution. There are a lot of reasons why scientists think that life is way less likely to occur on a planet in a red dwarf system. Every time some tabloid writes an article about another Earth's twin, almost always it's a planet that orbits a red dwarf. First, younger red dwarfs are considered to be much more active than sun-like stars. Flares and mass ejections can be ten times more powerful and happen way more frequently. 
that can sterilize the planet's surface and destroy an atmosphere and as a result not let life form and develop. Also because red dwarfs are much cooler and dimmer, the habitable zone is much closer to a star. That means a planet can be tidily locked. One hemisphere always faces a star and the other never gets any light. So the climate should be very different. Oh, here's a quest for you. Open up a catalog of known exoplanets. Select gas giants and count how many of them orbit M dwarfs. Spoiler alert, there are almost none. It's believed that giant planets that orbit red dwarfs are rare, and when they are found, it's usually big news with headlines like this. Surprise! Giant planet found circling tiny red dwarf star. So there aren't many known giant planets orbiting red dwarfs, and they could have a positive effect on life. For instance, by deflecting some of large bodies from a planet that might have life evolving on it. So according to David Kipping, the author of the paper, Taking all this into account, life is about 100 times less likely to occur on a planet orbiting a red dwarf, pairing to F, G and K class stars. Obviously, it's not that simple and we are judging based on what we know today. And that's no accident that the author uses Bayesian statistics, which can be updated after getting new data. The third solution in the paper is called a truncated window for complex life which basically means that life can have not enough time to appear. But wait a second, haven't I just said that red dwarfs exist way longer than sun-like stars? But here is the thing, the solution specifically talks about PMS stars. But what are PMS stars? I think I haven't seen those in spectral classifications. PMS means pre-main sequence star. It is an evolutionary stage of a star. Those are very young stars, which probably are not even fusing hydrogen into helium yet, but they could fuse deuterium, and also some heat is produced by a gravitational contraction of matter. At that stage, a star can still have an accretion disk, strong winds, jets, and powerful magnetic fields. It's possible for PMS stars to even be brighter than main sequence stars. But red dwarfs can be on this stage for a billion years. And so it could start a runaway greenhouse effect on a planet in a habitable zone, which would drastically rise the temperature and not allow life to form. But PMS phase for sun-like stars is much shorter. And there is the fourth option. In the exoplanet catalog, which now has over 5,000 exoplanets, more than 3,000 were discovered with Kepler telescope. So, according to the author of the paper, 16% of planets discovered by Kepler that orbit red dwarfs could be rocky planets in habitable zones. That's quite a lot. So, red dwarfs are frequent and rocky planets orbiting them can also be abundant. But perhaps this 16% estimate doesn't reflect what is actually going on, and here's why. This whole statistics is based on observation of a single observatory. Perhaps it couldn't see all of the red dwarfs in its field of view. It could have detected only the brightest ones. So the low mass dimmer stars were not detected and those stars are supposed to represent the majority of M dwarfs. What if those low mass stars have way less rocky planets in habitable zones? then the statistics would be worse. Taking that into account, the author concludes that potentially habitable planets could be a hundred times less likely to occur around red dwarfs. But again, that's only a certain type of planets at a certain distance of a star. We didn't account for various conditions, presence or lack of atmospheres and their properties. So without that, potentially habitable planets around red dwarfs are rare. And because those are the most abundant stars, life, especially complex life, if it even appears, can be rare. This solution is intertwined with the possible solution to a different paradox, the famous Fermi paradox. Where is everyone? If our galaxy has so many planets and life had plenty of time to develop, why can't we see a single alien civilization? Actually, habitable planets are rare. Here's why. Obviously, there is a lot more to it, but just the fact that most of the stars can lack habitable planets at least gives us something to think about. While the first solution doesn't give us any new information and it's not clear how to test it, it's different with other solutions. In the case of the second solution, we can make our prediction more and more precise by adding more new data. For instance, by studying atmospheres of exoplanets, activity of stars, finding biosignatures and so on. If astronomers start finding lots of planets with runaway greenhouse effects that orbit red dwarfs, 
That will favor the third solution. The same goes for the fourth solution. The more exoplanets we discover, especially at the less massive red dwarfs, the better statistics we will have. For that we need more research, new surveys and telescopes. And of course it's possible that there isn't a single solution, but some of them could work at the same time. Sure, at the first glance this paradox might sound weird, but after all it raises several important questions in the field of exoplanet studies. Some estimates are given and also they could get better in future, and also some ideas of how to test all this. The origin of life depends on a lot of factors, but a star planet orbits is one of the most important ones. But we should study other factors as well. And by doing all this we can get closer to answering the question how often does life occur in the universe? Thanks for watching. Links to all of the sources are down below in the description. And if you enjoy the video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Bye.